Lee Young Lee um, lives in Chicago. His first book of poems, Rose, when it appeared, I don't remember how many years ago now, woke everybody up who was reading poetry. It was a poem, a book of extraordinary clarity, calm, gentleness, and strangeness. Partly, it was the poetry of a family um, and of uh, one of the things that arrested me about it, I remember thinking about it at the time that I read it, was that the kind of affection, the sort of love that got expressed by, an, by the poet, adult child speaker in the poem, to the parents was so pure and guileless that it was hard to imagine an American making that move. Um, and it was unsentimental. It was awake and unsentimental. And why it was unsentimental wasn't clear to me. It's the, you know, family intimacy is the most difficult subject in some way. It moves us so deeply, and yet the, it's surround. It doesn't prove anything, you know. Stormtroopers love their children. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, it doesn't, it, it, in a way it stands for a lot. The deepest tidal pulls of human feeling, the ones that make us want to, you know, sob during Kramer and Kramer, um, are attached to it. And yet its resonances are, are odd to locate. Um, and this book, without particularly reaching out to a wider social world, located them in some way so this material was totally alive and not sentimental. And the writing was of, in a way, of its period. Um, uh, clear, shorter lines, sculpted, and it, it just an entirely achieved book that everybody who read fell in love with. And it made him, with one book, one of the most interesting and sought after young poets in the country, a condition that he seemed either to be oblivious of or to totally ignore because he went on in his second book, The City in Which I Love You, not to write what would have, what everybody wanted, I guess, which was more of the same or an extension of this into some recognizable version of the growing body of Asian American poetry, a relatively new thing in American culture in the um, 1970s and 80s, um, uh, he didn't write that kind of autobiographical poem. He wrote a strange, turbulent, symbolist-inflected, perhaps heart crane-inflected uh, poetry that wrote in a longer line, took more risks, tried to locate itself in metaphor, seemed emotionally rich, alive to surfaces, baffled, um, large, like a big cloudscape for me, that book. I thought, oh, this guy is unpredictable. He's going to change in different ways. That was followed by a prose book that was billed as a memoir and that read as a continuation of the concerns of the city in which I love you. It was as, as a book of um, a, 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 a book-length prose poem, a meditation on language, metaphor, origins, um, family, nature of time, that um, if, if his publisher thought he, they had a commercial bestseller on their hands, was going to find this is a very independent writer who goes his own way. So fairly recently, the third book of poems of this brilliant, restless poet appeared, and it it's partly returns to the prosody of Rose, and it's a poem that is um, a book that means to be baffled at some primary way about um, experience. It's a book that's attracted to and um, baffled by um, wisdom literature, literatures of spirituality. I found myself looking for the phrases that um, called this up for me, a room in a room Echo and shadow begins, and between them she leans in the doorway to say something, little bright above her face, threshold dark beneath her feet. People are often about to speak in these poems something that, is, is in, that exists in, in between the seams of definable experiences. It's in the, it's in the seams where things, where between waking and sleeping, between one 
set of attitudes and another between the domestic world and the undomesticated world outside it, seeming a lasting echo of my heart's calling me home, its story an ocean beyond my human beginning. Beyond my human beginning might be one of the ways of thinking about these poems. What I meant was the wind burying the dead, another line in a poem goes, homesickness in the rocks, homesickness in the trees, but homesickness for what and in what ways? These poems seem so alive to these issues and so um, um, uh, stunned into their voice by the music of these issues that you just feel like this is a poet who's, who's just going to continue to grow and wake us and boy, what fun it is to get to be a reader of his work as it unfolds. I've said enough. Welcome to Berkeley, Lee Young Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That, uh, I, mm, I don't know. I, can you hear this? Is that better? Oh. oh. Thank you, Bob, for that uh, introduction. I, uh, I, don't, hmm. I think you maybe picked out the best lines. The rest is just fodder. <laughs> but thank you so much. I, <clears throat> I f I'm honored to be here and happy. Uh, I guess I'll read and uh, talk a little bit for about 40, 40 minutes, and then. Uh, uh, thank you, all of you, for coming out. Uh, I, I, I got some telephone calls and some letters uh, uh, requesting to hear some poems, and I'll try to get to a, f a couple of them. But I'd like to read some new ones, too. Uh, can you hear this? Is this okay? Closer? Like that? Okay. Um, I was thinking... Uh, when I was a, a child, very tiny, my father asked me one day, uh, he said, do you know how many breaths a human being takes in a day? And I, and I said, no. He said, on the average, uh, 14 to 16,000. And I started counting, like, is that true? And, uh, and he said, what I want you to start doing is, uh, as you inhale, say uh, goodbye, and as you exhale, say thank you. Uh, don't say, don't think anything else. Just do that. And uh, I tried to do that. And after about three years of trying to do that, uh, everything was grief-stricken for me. I would, you know, be looking at my father's face. He'd be talking to me, and I'd be saying goodbye, thank you, goodbye, thank you. And, uh, and that was a very strange experience. But I've been thinking. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a request. Somebody asked to hear a love poem, and I'm a little embarrassed by it because there's something. Uh, you know, my my wife said to me, well, you only write about love so that you can write about death. And I think she's right, and I've been wondering about that and why that, that's true. And uh, I'm going to say something, uh, a few things about that, just to think my way through this. But I've been thinking about human speech, and I thought to myself that... Uh, well, it's obvious that all speech is performed with the outgoing breath, that is, the exhale, exhale breath. Uh, when we inhale, our bodies get filled with life, our uh, blood gets filled with oxygen, our bones actually get harder, our muscles get more tone when we inhale. Uh, and when we exhale, our bodies actually soften, our bones actually soften, our uh, muscles get softer. So that when we inhale, it's, it's, you could think of it as a, an infeeding breath. And as we exhale, it's the outgoing breath or the dying breath. But since speech, all speech is performed with the outgoing breath, all speech is done with the dying breath. What is so odd to me, is the more I think about it, uh, is as we speak, meaning gets divulged. Uh, the, 
the more of a sentence that you unspool, the more of your meaning gets disclosed. So that meaning increases in opposite ratio to vitality. So on the one hand, of course these are obvious, but there's something else I, I wanted to get to. Is a, it's paradigmatic of life, of course. As we die, the meaning of our lives gets unfolded. Uh, so that when we score human speech in poetry, it seems to me that poets are obsessed with death because, obs because the medium is the dying breath. So you can't even begin a poem without... Uh, I mean, that's the medium, right? So you're, you're, you're death, you're dying. But there's no way around it because there's no other way to disclose meaning. Now, I was thinking to myself that all speech is a... Uh, implies that there's a speaker, right? So all speech is somehow creates a picture of a speaker or implies a, a portrait of a speaker. So one could say that all speech in a way is self-portraiture. I don't know, we could talk about this later and, and prove or disprove it, but I, I'm, I'm just... So I think the anxiety of making poems is one becomes so aware that one's medium is the dying breath, and what you're trying to do is ransom that with as much psychic, intellectual, emotional content as possible. And it seems to me that poetry is the perfect medium for that. Uh, Marsha? Hi. Uh, uh, so where, where was I now? Oh, okay. Uh, so that I, I, when I read these poems, the more I think about this, the more I feel that the poems I'm about to read you, and I have to apologize. You know, I have a friend who says, never apologize before your readings. I can't help it. Uh, I have to apologize. They seem insufficient to me because ultimately there doesn't seem to be enough that I can do to ransom this medium. Uh, that ultimately uh, it's always about dying. Uh, well, on that depressing note, uh, here's a. I'll, I'll begin with this request and then I'll. Uh, no, you know what? I'm going to read you a poem. I was going to read this one later, but I'll read it now. Uh, when I was little, my father would always ask me, uh, every morning he said, he would, I would come down the stairs and he would say, have you prayed? <clears throat> and I would lie and I would say yes. Uh, and I lied about um, many things w with him. And uh, I never felt guilty until now. He's been dead for, <laughs> he's been dead for uh, over 20 years. And uh, one day I heard his voice uh, asking me, have you prayed? And I was overwhelmed with grief. And uh, sh do I need to be any louder than this? Is this okay? A little louder? Okay. This is called, have you prayed? Have you prayed? When the wind turns and asks in my father's voice have you prayed I know three things one I'm not finished answering to the dead two a man is four winds and three fires and the four winds are his father's voice his mother's voice, or maybe he's seven winds and ten fires. And the fires are seeing, hearing, touching, dreaming, thinking, or is he the breath of God? When the wind turns traveler and asks in my father's voice, have you prayed? I remember three things. One, a father's love is milk and sugar. Two-thirds worry, two-thirds grief. And what's left over is trimmed and leavened 
to make the bread the dead and the living share. And patience? That's to endure the terrible leavening and kneading. And wisdom? That's my father's face in sleep. When the wind asks, have you prayed? I know it's only me reminding myself a flower is one station between Earth's wish and Earth's rapture. And blood was fire, salt, and breath long before it quickened any wand or branch, any limb that woke speaking. It's just me in the gowns of the wind or my father threw me, asking, Have you found your refuge yet? Asking, Are you happy? Funny, a troubled father, a happy son, the wind with a voice, and me without one. Oh, thank you. So I don't know what that means, that one creates a portrait or a presence by displacing one's own presence, because you're using the outgoing, exhaled, dying breath to create the portrait of a person, a speaker, but you have to displace your own... I don't know what it means. I don't know what I'm getting. Anyway, um, I'll go on with this poem. This is a love poem, too. I, <clears throat> this is uh, for my son. I mention in here Union Station. It's a train station in Chicago. And uh, there's a train that goes, that runs... Uh, East and West. It's called the 20th Century. And uh, I go down to the train station every morning to have my coffee on the way to work, and I love to hear the, the announcements. You know, it says the 20th century is about to arrive. <laughs> um, everybody on board. The 20th century has just departed. And it's so, you know, it's kind of amazing. Uh, my son was learning piano with uh, uh, my sister, and she was teaching him. Every good boy deserves fudge. Do you know that thing? He, you know, he, w yeah, every good boy does fine. And uh, he'd been learning for years, and then he asked me one day, is that true, Baba? That every good boy does fine. And I thought for a while. I said, no. Uh, I said, every wise child is sad. And I know, and my sister, uh, <laughs> my sister shoved me hard, you know. She said, uh, you're, you're going to ruin these kids, telling them that kind of thing. But I thought hard about that, and I thought, well, it's kind of true. So I wrote this poem to, uh, I don't know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But it's called, Every Wise Child is Sad. Every wise child is sad. As old as the stars, He's not old enough to heat his milk on the stove. Prince and a member of the grass, he believes every wind-strewn blossom is God tearing God. And the stars are leaves blown across his grandmother's lap, or the dew multiplying Every laughing child is forgetful. Every solitary child rules the universe. As old as night itself, that is, older than his name and his mother and father's names, yet he doesn't know what a minute weighs or is an hour a little or a lot. But of time's many hands, he can tell the bloody 
from the perfumed, the feathered one with claws from the hairy one wearing rings. And he knows about the goodbyes, some of them anyway, the goodbye at the door each morning, a kiss for a kiss, the goodbye at bedtime, stories and songs until it's safe to close his eyes. And maybe he's even heard about the waiting room at Union Station, where dust and echoes climb to the great skylights, accompanied by farewells of the now going, to join the distant farewells of the long gone, while a voice announces the departure of the 20th century for all points west. Yes, every wise child is heartbroken a sorrowing pip. He knows the play he's called away from each evening is all that keeps naming possible in a human household. He's sure his singing to himself and his rising and falling ball are appointed by ancient laws his own heart tides obey but he can't tell a single other what he knows. Old enough to knot his shoelaces, but not old enough to unknot them. Old enough to pray, he doesn't always know who to pray to. Old enough to know to close the window when it storms. Old enough to know the rain, given the chance, would fall on him and darken him, and darken him, the way he himself colors the figures he draws, pressing so hard he tears the page. Oh, thank you. I have a friend who, uh, a dear friend, a friend I love who can't stand to read poetry, but I read it to him all the time. <laughs> and uh, every time we talk, we have to redefine our terms. And uh, so he keeps me on my toes. He owns hotels, so uh, I, I keep telling him that's why he hates poetry. Uh, so I, I, I wrote this as a conversation uh, with him. It's called Preface to a Conversation. Preface to a Conversation. By home, do you mean where we start or how we live? By the dove's voice, do you mean a sodden bed of leaves? or an unheated room in autumn? Or is that my voice at the window? Or has my dead brother's shirt collar begun to yellow? A dove's peeled breast could barely feed a soul. The hunger it tolls is my own inheritance. Or have I slept too long under my mother's pear trees have I traded my mother's tablecloth for a shadow of the falling petals? And by dream, what do you mean by dream? And if by dying I mean wins the seat between finished earth and the speaking fire alive inside each thing woven of dust and yearning, you may safely guess the dove's tremors are lapsed echoes of that native voice, the fire enthroned. The dove's flying away casts a shadow. Look, now a bridge, now a gate, 
now my hands parting the curtain to find the rest of the day. So we're talking about birds. I'll read you some bird poems. I sometimes think that, uh, that one of the One of the wonderful things that language can do is it can f inflect inner space so that we experience it as something visceral. You know, if it weren't for uh, uh, that capacity of language, we would, m we would not believe we had anything such as inner space. So I think birds are uh, kind of uh, masters of space. and. Uh, I'd been watching them a long time before I could write this poem. I'm not sure about this poem. Sometimes I read it and it feels true to me, and sometimes I read it and uh, it doesn't feel true. So I, I don't know how I'll feel as I read it today. You know, sometimes I think birds are wonderful, and sometimes I hate them. They, they seem to me like little bugs with wings. Uh, <laughs> but when I wrote this, I felt the opposite. This is called Praise Them. Praise them. The birds don't alter space. They reveal it. The sky never fills with any leftover flying. They leave nothing to trace. It is our own astonishment collects in chill air. Be glad. They equal their due moment, never begging, and enter ours without parting day. See how three birds in a winter tree make the tree bearer. Two fly away, and new rooms open in December. Give up what you guessed about a whirring heart the little beaks and claws, their constant hunger. We're the nervous ones. If even one of our violent number could be gentle long enough that one of them found it safe inside our finally untroubled and untroubling gaze, who wouldn't hear what's singing completes us. Here's another one about birds. Um, this is about making uh, Chinese characters, but these aren't real Chinese characters, so don't try to look these up or anything like that. These are my own characters. This is called A Table in the Wilderness. A Table in the Wilderness. I draw a window and a man sitting inside it. I draw a bird in flight above the lintel. That's my picture of thinking. If I put a woman there instead of the man, it's a picture of speaking. If I draw a second bird in the woman's lap, it's ministering. A third flying below her feet, now it's singing. <clears throat> or erase the birds, make ivy branching around the woman's ankles, clinging to her knees, and it becomes remembering. You'll have to find your own pictures, whoever you are, whatever your need. As for me, many small hands issuing from a waterfall means silence mothered me. 
the hours hung like fruit in night's tree means when I close my eyes and look inside me, a thousand open eyes span the moment of my waking. Meanwhile, the clock adding a grain to a grain and not getting bigger, subtracting a day from a day and never having less means the honey lies awake all night inside the honeycomb, wondering who its parents are. And even my death isn't my death, unless it's the unfathomed brow of a nameless face. Even my name isn't my name, except the bees assemble a table to grant a stranger light and moment in a wilderness of who and where. I was talking to a, a friend who writes a lot of wonderful criticism, and we were talking about the nature of metaphor, and uh, hopelessly ignorant, I, I revealed myself to him many times as that. I told him uh, I'm ignorant, and we were talking, and. Uh, this is after years, and recently he said to me, you know, Leon, you're an ignoramus. I said, I've been trying to tell you that for years. He said, well, I thought you were just being humble. But uh, one of the uh, uh, assumptions, I, I, it, uh, I decided that the reason we, we have such uh, heated arguments is uh, one of the assumptions that I have is that metaphor isn't a literary device. He was trying to convince me that metaphor is a literary device. I understand metaphor as a way to... Uh, how do I say this? Integrate uh, incompatible psychic contents. You know, like honeycomb and time. Like, what do they have to do with each other? Or when you make a metaphor out of them, you're trying to find some sort of integration between those two psychic realities. Like a honeycomb has a psychic reality, right? A psychological reality, an emotional reality. Time has the other one. So when you make a metaphor, you're integrating the two concepts. And he says, oh no, they're just words which confused me. I, I, I don't understand. I thought words actually referred to concepts. So when you do something with words, the concepts are getting... Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to defend, I guess, my own propensity toward metaphor. Uh, here's another one. <laughs> this is called Black Petal. Black Petal. I never claimed night fathered me. That was my dead brother talking in his sleep. I keep him under my pillow, a dear wish that colors my laughing and crying. I never said the wind, remembering nothing, leaves so many rooms unaccounted for, only continual farewell ransoms the unmistakable fragrance our human days afford. It was my brother, little candle in the pulpit, reading out loud to all of earth from the Book of Night. He died too young to learn his name. Now he answers to vacant boat, burning wing, my black petal. Ask him who his mother is. He'll declare the birds have eaten the path home. But each of us joins night's ongoing story wherever night overtakes him, the heart astonished to find belonging and thanks answering thanks. Ask if he's hungry or thirsty. He'll say he's the bread come to pass and draw you a map to the 12 secret hips of honey. Does someone want to know the way to spring? He'll remind you 
the flower was never meant to survive the fruit's triumph. He says an apple's most secret cargo is the enduring odor of a human childhood, our mother's linen pressed and stored, our father's voice walking through the rooms. He says he's forgiven our sister for playing dead and making him cry those afternoons we were left alone in the house. And when clocks frighten me with their long hair, and when I spy the wind's numerous hands in the orchard unfastening first the petals from the buds, then the perfume from the flesh, my dead brother ministers to me. His voice weighs nothing but the far years between stars in their massive dying. And I grow quiet hearing how many of both of our tomorrows lie waiting inside it to be born. Thank you. <clears throat> this is called Little Round. Little round. My fool asks, do the years spell a path to later be remembered? Who's there to read them back? My death says, one bird knows the hour and suffers to house its millstone weight as song. My night watchman lies down in a room by the sea and hears the water telling out of a thousand mouths the story behind his mother's sleeping face. My eternity shrugs and yawns. Let the stars knit and fold inside their numbered rooms. When night asks who I am, I answer your own, and am not lonely. My loneliness, my sleepless darling, reminds herself the fruit that falls increases at the speed of the body rising to meet it. And my child, he sleeps and sleeps. And my mother, she divides the rice, today's portion from tomorrow's, tomorrow's from ever after. And my father, he faces me and rows toward what he can't see. And my God, what have I done with my God? I'll read one more poem. I think that's that's, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, your generosity of attention. This is something I'm working on right now. <clears throat> this is called Poor Shadow. Poor Shadow. My shadow is trying to decide if the universe is a flowering tree or the sleep of a woman who carries, without her knowing it yet, the word at the end of the story of time. Me? I'm just waiting for evening. Then I'll know what I feel. My shadow, my shadow, though, is troubled. It wants to know the word the woman will speak upon waking. 
It wonders, does time blossom, ripen, or branch in two directions, seen and unseen? And what is flesh? Perfume? Some pollen? The very sap? Me? I don't care about that. I'm waiting for the playground to empty. Then I can call out the stations of the moon, the open book, the trumpet entombed, the silent answer. Me, I'm waiting for the leaves to travel. Then I can trade places with the wind. Then I'll remember that old story beginning with the great herds of stars at pasture. Meanwhile, my shadow grows more desperate every minute, asking, in which room of the sleepless clock do our clothes lie folded for the final journey? My shadow is crying, the bread that wakes in a house that fails. What table fathered it? It's protesting, the pillow awaiting your head is just so much cloud. Poor shadow, while I sleep, it will sit at the window all night, thinking, Dear shadow, may you hear the singing that entrances the seed of each fruit born falling, a singing without issue, become becoming. Thank you very much.